God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, accept our prayers on behalf of thy servant Timothy, and grant him an entrance into the land of life and joy, in the fellowship of thy saints, through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this I left, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes, and from people and languages, standing before the throne, and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around, throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessed and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him by day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. 
for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The Lord. Thanks, Lord. Thanks. Please join me as we pray in unison, Psalm 23. The Lord, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Him. 
Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to thee, Lord Christ. Christ. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, enlighten our darkness with the light of your Holy Spirit. For I proclaim these words in the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The sad thing about today is that even a year ago, there was probably no way we expected that we would find ourselves here today. Tim was only a couple years older than me, kind of a reality check, and although he had been in the hospital for a while, the news of his passing was still a shock to many of us. And that is why this gospel reading this morning, I think, seems so relevant. For in the gospel narrative, we hear a small discussion between Jesus and Martha, whose brother Lazarus has died. Later on, we read that Jesus goes to her brother's tomb and raises him from the dead. Martha doesn't really know what to expect. Jesus asks her various questions, and she answers well, even though she might not really know what she's saying. Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. There's a sense in which she maybe blames Jesus for her brother's death and may want him to fix the situation, but she doesn't really know what she's asking. So Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And those same words apply to us today. Your brother, our brother, will rise again. History isn't finished as soon as someone dies, because all of history belongs to God, and God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Your brother will rise again, says Jesus, and Martha says to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Listen to how Martha makes this really good confession of faith, even though she doesn't really fully know what she's talking about. She's talking to Jesus like, he might not get the job done. Or when he gets the job done, it'll be so off, far off in the future, it doesn't fix the pain of now. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whenever I am around, there is resurrection. Now this morning, we have come to worship God and to celebrate a brother, an uncle, a cousin, a friend, an all-around good guy named Tim. And we know for one thing that God sent Tim to you for your benefit. And also God put you here for him. God looks after the world by appointing people to look after it. God looked after you and took care of you by sending you Tim. And now God looked after Tim and took care of him by sending you to him. There's no doubt that Tim was a unique creation of God. Anna and Mark shared many memories with me about their life with their brother, beginning with his name. It seems that their parents chose biblical first names for each of them. Timothy, of course, comes from the disciple 
uh, whose book is named after his, his epistle letter. His middle name, uh, Tim's middle name, was Charles, chosen from his maternal grandmother. Now, Tim was, he was a very quiet and easily embarrassed guy. But if he felt that someone was not being treated fairly, he'd be the first person, he'd be the kind of person to speak up for them. He was the kind of person that would give you the shirt off his back. He was the kind of person who was always quietly concerned about people having enough of what they needed. Tim was a kind and loving man who had a special affinity towards animals. He was meticulous with the upkeep of his vehicles, machinery, and appliances around the house. And when Mark found that the Mongol training track had been converted into a tool rack, Tim said, well, would you rather hang tools or play trains? Tim was an immensely practical guy. Of his twin brother, Mark said that Tim taught him that difficult things are not quite as difficult as they seem to be at first. He also taught you that you shouldn't listen to anyone not doing better than you are. Tim was a philosopher of sorts, and if you engaged him in conversation, you quickly realized just how smart he was. He enjoyed movies from the late 70s, particularly ones that explored the effects of materialism on American youth. He loved walking on trails and visiting the Emporia Zoo. He was eclectic in his taste, enjoying rap music, which was a surprise, and particularly rap battles, which really surprised me, and also retro music from the late 70s and 80s, including the rock music of ACDC. Tim could be very funny, and, and Mark said he would playfully engage his brother, or it, 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 him and his sister, in these rap battle insults, uh, <laughs> which would have been very amusing. I wish you had some of those tapes. He could express himself with a wit that was fast and creative, and when he lived in Kansas City, he enjoyed the culture that surrounded him, especially the Nelson Art Gallery. He loved situational humor, especially of the ironic kind. As a little boy, he was fascinated with submarines, which you might have picked up from this morning's bulletin cover, and his dad built several models of submarines with him. His favorite childhood game, you might have guessed it, Battleship, which reflected his interest in naval, Navy vessels. Tim also loved helicopters. In fact, his mom, Diane, found some fabric print with helicopters on it and made him a pair of pants. <laughs> Anne said that uh, they had long car trips in their Ford station wagon with that fake wood paneling on the side to see summer each, or to see family each summer, and they were very memorable. The trip took twice as long as it should because with the three of them, they seemed to stop at every restaurant between here and there. One of these uh, vacations that they remember best was with Tim, uh, when they went to Wisconsin and Chicago to see family, and they stopped first at their home in Tomahawk, and then the Willis Tower, and the Museum of Science and Industry, where especially the U-505 submarine exhibit was a thrill to Tim. As a youngster, Tim liked checking out books from the library about the submarines and helicopters. And as early as second grade, Mark said he could tell you the year, make, and model of any car just by looking at them. Anne also recalled a very special trip to Washington, D.C., where Tim, Anne, and Mark had the opportunity to ride an old-fashioned carousel that was full of these beautiful horses and one frog. Tim rode the frog, probably because he felt it was left out, and Tim always sided with the underdog. As typical siblings, there were fights and disagreements, but Tim had a unique way to get back at Anne, for she had one of those barrel locks on her bedroom door, and when Tim was mad at her, he would just take the lock receiver off the door frame so she couldn't lock her bedroom door no more. <laughs> Tim loved to attend family events and kept detailed notes or an item from each event to remember. His cousins remember him as always being very mischievous and loving to share jokes. Visits to Anne's house at the holidays were very special. There he could spend time with his niece and nephews as well as have a decent home with meal. Tim was a devoted and loving uncle, always taking time to play with his nieces and nephews. And when Hannah got a game called 
pretty princesses, which required a person to wear a bracelet, a pair of earrings, and a ring and a crown in order to be the winner. Tim played it with her without any hesitation. He was a very good sport. He loved to go go-karting riding with his nephew Christian and discussing physics with him. Tim also liked to talk about physics and music and stand-up comedy with Nicholas. He attended as many sports, recitals, and graduations as he could, and most recently attended his goddaughter and niece Hannah and husband Clayton's wedding in May of 2020. With the possible exception of God, Tim loved his family above all else. When his dad became sick with cancer, Tim worked tirelessly to care for him as he fought the disease. When Larry had fought his last battle and their mom became a widow, Tim continued to do things around the house, taking her to doctor's appointments and offering her companionship. Diane's sudden death in 2017 was a huge blow, and Tim became somewhat lost in his grief. He had cared for his parents for so long, and their departure left a huge hole in his heart. Now, grief is really a peculiar animal, but I'd like to think that coming back to worship with the community here at St. Andrews helped bring some healing to his wounded heart. Recently, I had the opportunity to sit at his desk in his bedroom. He had many things on his desk. I wish I could show you a picture, <laughs> including a 12-inch high foam board statue of Albert Einstein and Thomas Edison. Um, and I wish you also could see the wall behind his desk. It was covered with poster notes containing information, important pieces of information, phone numbers, scripture verses, sayings that Tim wanted to remember, all plastered all over his, in front of his desk, kind of like Tim's own version of a vision board. In the center was a small frame picture of the astronaut's footprint left behind during the lunar landing. He loved keychains and phones. I mean, when you heard the landline ring at the Valentine's house, you knew it for there were upward of nine different phones ringing at one time. And on his desk, he had this beautiful red rotary dial phone. And when I looked at it, all I could think of was Adam West Batman <laughs> and the Commissioner of Stone. I, I wanted it to light up. But anyway, Tim's many little projects surrounding his room indicated his love of just staying busy and tinkering. Now, Tim, Mark, and Anne and I have something in common, for we all grew up as PKs. That's pastor or priest kid, depending on the tradition. There are definite pluses and minuses to this kind of upbringing, but it is clear to me that one thing left an indelible mark on Tim's life, and that was his faith, because it was an essential component of his life. He faithfully attended worship, and was a devoted reader of scripture. Mark said that Tim had a very definite definition of urgency when it came to interrupting his Bible study time. He was also quick to share what he had with those in need and was a friend to all he met. His kindness was evident in that he could talk to almost anyone, even though initially he seemed very shy. Tim was thankful for the things he had and Mark said he taught him how to share more willingly and that fair play triumphs over an unfair world. He exemplified in many ways what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Hanging on the wall opposite his bed was a large wooden crucifix, a reminder to Tim of the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf, a sacrifice that is very difficult to understand. In our gospel, Jesus said some things to Martha that she doesn't really understand. She doesn't understand what Jesus means when he says, Your brother will rise again, and I am the resurrection and the life. But when Jesus goes and raises her brother from the dead, <laughs> she gets it. The light switches on for her. In the Christian faith, we also say that those who have died will rise again. We don't just say that they'll be alive. We say that they will rise again, and that's what Easter Sunday is all about. Christians throughout the world don't just say Christ is alive, but Christ is risen. He is risen from the dead. In this life, we are going to suffer. We are going to have loss, and we will also mourn. In this life, 
we will eventually all die. But we believe also that we will rise. So Jesus says, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And now we can say of him that he is resting with his Lord. But the story doesn't end there. The story doesn't even end when Jesus himself gives back to us our loved ones in the resurrection. The most important thing is this. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. In a sense, Martha listens to these words, and she doesn't really know what he's talking about. And the same goes for us. We sometimes don't know what Jesus is talking about. But don't let that stop us. All faith, all faith, begins with blindness. It doesn't begin with sight. It begins with hearing the words of the living Jesus Christ, who holds life and death in his hand. Now we see in a mirror dimly, says St. Paul. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. I flipped through Tim's Bible while I was at his desk. Great big living Bible that I like to read. I sometimes do that after someone passes. Sometimes prayer books or Bibles will have little pieces of things in them that are important to people that they are holding on to. And I found this bookmark with this wonderful prayer, a prayer attributed to St. Ignatius of Loyola. Tim's faith was so profound, more than I ever knew or realized. And I invite you to let this prayer become Tim's final earthly prayer for you. O Christ Jesus, when all is darkness, and we feel our weakness and helplessness, give us the sense of your presence, your love, and your strength. Help us to have perfect trust in your protecting love and strengthening power, so that nothing may frighten or worry us. For living close to you, we shall see your hand, your purpose, your will, through all things. Amen. In the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us now stand to proclaim our faith and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Almighty God, who has knit together thine elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of thy Son, Christ our Lord, grant, we beseech thee, to thy whole church in paradise and on earth, thy light and thy peace. Amen. Amen. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to newness of life, and that through the grave and gate of death, we may pass with him to our joyful resurrection. Amen. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith, 
that thy Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. Amen. Grant to thy faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve thee with a quiet mind. Amen. Grant to all who mourn a sure confidence in thy bodily care, that, passing all their grief on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love. Amen. Give courage and faith to those who are bereaved, that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a reasonable and holy hope, in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Amen. Help us, we pray, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. Amen. Grant us grace to entrust him to thy never-failing love. Receive him into the arms of thy mercy, and remember him according to the favor which thou bearest unto thy people. Amen. Grant that, increasing in knowledge and love of thee, he may go from strength to strength in the life of perfect service in thy heavenly kingdom. Amen. Grant us, to all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, to have our consummation and bliss in thy eternal and everlasting glory, and with blessed Mary, St. Andrew, and all thy saints, to receive the crown of life which thou hast promised to all who share in the victory of thy Son, Jesus Christ who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let us share Christ's peace among us. explanation. Um, I know that there may be people here from multiple traditions this morning, but in the Episcopal tradition, if you uh, come ready to receive Christ in Holy Communion, you are welcome to receive Christ this day among us. So when it's time, the ushers will assist you row by row to come forward. You may receive, this is how we receive in our church under our current uh, COVID guidelines. So I'm the only one that touches it. <laughs> so basically, if you want the bread alone, you'll stand in front of me when you come forward. If you want both, and you want me to tinct your bread and then place it in your hand or on your tongue, then you stand in front of the Eucharist minister. Stretch out your hands. Don't do this. Stretch out your hands, because if you do this, you'll touch me. That's not what we're trying to avoid. But that's how we'll know what you desire. If you don't feel comfortable receiving, you may simply cross your hands and receive a blessing, um, and, uh, you're, but you're welcome to receive from our table today. For the offering, you may be seated for the, for the hymn. Be imitators of God and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
like to mercy bids give thy only Son, Jesus Christ, to take our nature upon him, and to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there a full and perfect sacrifice for the whole world, and did institute in his holy gospel a command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. <coughs> For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks to thee, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me.
We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in your own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table. But thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him. And he in us. Amen. And now, would you join me in the post communion prayer? Because I messed up. <laughs> Wouldn't be a human place if we didn't have at least one slip up in service. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank thee that in thy great love thou hast fed us with the spiritual food and drink of the blood and blood of thy Son Jesus Christ, and hast given us to us a foretaste of thy heavenly banquet. Grant that this sacrament may be unto to us a comfort in affliction, and a pledge that our inheritance in that kingdom, where there is no death, neither sorrow nor crying, but the fullness of joy with all thy saints. I know Tim would have found that slip up funny. <laughs> and he would have given me a hard time later. <laughs> would you join me in the commendation? Give rest of Christ to thy servant with thy saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sign but thy everlasting.
Bitte egal.